What is up, everybody? Welcome to the Tech Interview Guide live stream. Uh, welcome to all Odie. Thanks for the follow. Appreciate that. Hope you all doing well. Um, tonight's going to be uh, more Q and A. I've had like tons and tons of questions coming in, so I want to focus on some Q and A. Uh, also, want to get to two resume reviews that I've been sitting on for a minute. Um, I was hoping to have somebody named Margo on this show. Margo and I work together at SendGrid, and uh, it's been kind of hard getting in touch with her lately. Um, I'm going to try and reach out to her soon. I was hoping to do some resume reviews with uh, with Margo because she's an awesome, awesome person. But uh, we'll get to those resume reviews in a little bit. I got. Eh, maybe a dozen or, or fewer questions to kind of go through. Um, and then, uh, like I said, I've got two resume reviews. But how's the job hunt going? Um, I mean, my my usual Sunday evening kind of stream uh, before all my shoulder surgery and all that nonsense was um, like hearing from all of you. Like what's going on in your job hunt? What's going on, uh, you know, with your interviewing and your interview prep? How can I help? Uh, so definitely swing by the chat, ask some questions in there be happy to uh, answer those uh, as we go. So I'll interject uh, any questions and things like that, uh, aside from the questions that uh, that I typically want to go through uh, from a couple of different sources. So I get asked questions over LinkedIn, I get asked questions over Twitter, I get asked questions over Quora. So I kind of like, uh, you know, put them all together in one spot and I just kind of read off a list and just kind of give my thoughts on them. Um, again, these are just my own thoughts and opinions. It doesn't mean that this is absolutely the way to go. Um, or absolutely like carved in stone by any means. Um, this is just my own opinions. I like to kind of throw that around a lot. Uh, opinions are like armpits. Everybody's got, generally got a couple and some of them stink. Uh, so you don't just have to take my advice. You just have to listen to me. Um, but yeah, this is, uh, this is it. So um, one question that I had come in was like, can you tell us about your job? Um, and so I wanted to take a minute and just kind of give a shout out to Stream. Uh, this is their... 3D printed logo over here. Um, so Stream is the company that I work for in Colorado and Stream makes APIs. So we're a SaaS API company, uh, system as a service or software as a service. And the APIs that we use uh, help other people power live chat and news feeds in their applications. Um, and so if you go to getstream.io, uh, you'll see some cool famous logos on there of companies that we work with. I won't mention them on the stream. Uh, but we work with a lot of really cool companies to just kind of power their apps. So news feeds like Instagram and Twitter, those are not our customers, but those are the kinds of things that we help people build into their application. Uh, that was the first product that we came up with. <clears throat> and then uh, a couple of years back, uh, they came up with the idea of, well, let's throw some live chat in there too. So, uh, so they currently serve up live chat as well as news feeds. And we've got some other stuff cooking, but I can't talk about any of that. Um, anyway, my role, uh, when I first got hired at Stream, so I, I worked at Stream and then I left there. I went to go teach at the Turing School of Software and Design for four years. And um, let's see, my role at that point uh, I started out as kind of their growth hacker, which is kind of like, how do we how do we kind of like get our name out there? How do we get people using our product? How do we get them to tell other people about us? Um, and so it was a lot of, you know, writing a lot of blog posts, going to developer conferences and, and meetups and things like that, just to get the word out there of who we are and what we do. And it kind of pivoted more into developer relations, but I was also doing everything from like pre-sales engineering to writing up tutorials, uh, building little apps. Like I actually had an app in the uh, in the Google App Store for a little while showing, you know, this is how we could make an Instagram feed and people would like download the app and take a picture and see it show up in the feed. Um, so it was kind of like an Instagram clone. Um, and I wrote up tutorials on like how to use Cassandra and things like that for, for those sorts of things. Um, as well as just comparison case studies and stuff like that. I had a lot of fun, um, but I really wanted to get into teaching at the time. And so I pivoted. Um, I started working at Turing. I kept working for Stream in the evenings. Um, and I did that. Uh, I did the two jobs together for about another six or seven months. And then I completely left Stream at that point and just focused on teaching because teaching got very, very busy. And uh, taught at Turing for four years and then uh, decided it was time to kind of get back into engineering again and looked around for a couple of different jobs and around that time uh, a couple of friends who worked with me at stream in the early days who were still there uh, they're like hey you should come by stream and, and talk to the ceo we're looking to bring someone on to do some training and so i talked to the ceo and this was uh, my latest famous sort of no interview sort of turn a conversation into a job offer uh, 
kind of situation. And basically what happened there is um, he said, well, we want to hire a whole bunch of engineers and we need to make sure they get onboarded well. And if they have gaps in their knowledge, we want to teach them and train them on how we want to do things as a company. Um, and so that was kind of our collaborative collective effort on, uh, on coming up with an idea of what that role was going to be. And so I became their director of engineering learning. Um, unfortunately, though, because a lot of people, when they read my title, they'd see, oh, director of engineering, and they stop reading beyond that point. And so I get flooded with all kinds of emails about director of engineering types of things and offshore, uh, you know, uh, consultation groups and things like that. And it's not my role. Uh, so my role primarily is focusing on education and uh, just helping people on board. And so we're going through a process right now of kind of examining like what we do as a company. So anyway, that's uh, that's stream. That's what I do for my day job. Uh, and in my evenings, I love to put together these streams and, uh, and help people out here. So I'm going to get over to my list of questions um, and we'll get started going down some of these. Um, like I said, I got maybe fewer than a dozen or so to go through and then a couple of resume reviews. But if you're in chat, feel free to uh, say hi in chat and uh, let me know what's going on in your job hunt. So if you've got interviews coming up, if you've got uh, interviews lined up, if you just got questions about interviews or interview prep or anything like that in the tech industry, uh, please drop that in chat. I'm happy to uh, kind of give my thoughts and opinions on that kind of stuff. So, uh, so let's get to it. So questions and answer time. Um, how do you get the feel of the interviewer before you actually go to the interview to know if they will possibly let you down? Um, I thought the, the wording of this question was a little bit interesting. I don't know so much that the interviewer themselves are going to let you down. I have, I have kind of my own questions about this question of why do you think the interviewer themselves is going to let you down? Is there, is there some sort of, uh, you know, story you're telling yourself in your mind that when you go to that interview, it's just going to not work out well. Um, cause sometimes walking in with that energy or walking in with that mindset, you know, you're going to cause problems, you know, sort of subconsciously. Um, and so I always tell people like get a good night's sleep the night before eat a good breakfast or a good kind of meal to start your day. Um, you know, take time for you do some deep breathing kinds of exercises. But if you're wondering like, how do I research something about the interviewer themselves so that I'm kind of better prepared by all means. I mean, Lee and I talked about that a couple of weeks back on the stream and we talked about it uh, on a couple of other streams. You got to be prepared when you walk into these interviews. You can't just walk in and wing it and ad lib things and, and hope you're going to get by. You have to prepare. You have to know what the company does. You have to research what they do. Um, you know, that kind of stuff. You have to be ready for that. And so uh, how do you get the feel for the interviewer? I'm just going to take just the first part of that question. How do you get the feel of the interviewer before you go into the interview? To, um, and then the second part is like, you know, how do you, how can you tell if they're going to possibly let you down? I'm, I'm curious if the wording of that means, you know, if you're going to get rejected or something like that, but I think those are two separate things. So, uh, this first part, how do you actually research the interviewer? Um, when the company contacts you and says, Hey, we want to sit down and interview you. You should have some point of contact. You should have somebody at the company that is in charge of of letting you know, this is what the process is. This is who's going to be interviewing you. Um, and if they don't, share that information with you ask them to share that information with you you can totally ask hey can i find out like what's the interview process like what should i study what should i prepare for so that when i come i can be ready and and, and uh you know practice you know certain types of problems or certain kinds of questions or are there multiple interviews um, and is this like going to be a behavioral interview is it going to be a technical interview is it a bit of both you can totally ask them those questions some companies will absolutely tell you like ahead of time, um, you know, all the all the different things and bits and pieces about their interview process. And I have a ton of respect for companies who are willing to uh, share that kind of information up front. Not every company will, but a lot of companies will share that up front. They want to see you succeed when you're at that point of the interview. They want to say yes. And so they don't want to like, you know get through the interview and go, nah, that didn't work out. Let's just go on and, and, you know, interview a bunch of other people. It's expensive for them to do this. It takes a lot of time and it's an expensive process. So they want to see you succeed. Um, and so I think more and more companies are willing to, um, to kind of make that sort of leap and say, yeah, we'll, we'll share a little bit more about our process with you, uh, kind of as we go. Um, and so definitely reach out to your point of contact and say, can I find out about the interview, but can I also find out who's interviewing me? and then go do research on them. 
Um, if you've already been networking with someone at the company, ask that person that you've been networking with about the people that you're interviewing with and say, hey, uh, you know, I found out I'm interviewing with Ian. You know, what's Ian like at the company? Can you tell me a little bit about his role? Um, can you tell me a little bit about what they do? Do you have a LinkedIn contact that you can share? Or can you make an introduction kind of thing? Um, it's totally okay to do that. It's absolutely okay to do that. So you got to you gotta research them. I usually tell uh, people who are, who are getting into the tech industry for the first time, especially if you're uh, coming from, you know, what we call the non-traditional path, although it's becoming a more traditional path of like not getting the CS degree, but still want to get into tech. So, you know, you get some other career or you've never gone to college and then you go to like a boot camp or a code program of some kind and now you're getting into the tech industry. Um, I completely lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, what was I saying? Oh, so you're, you're coming from this non-traditional background and how do you, how do you network and, and so on and finding out about them. And if you find out that the person that's interviewing you has kind of that traditional background, then you can kind of gauge, okay, well, they're more likely to ask me CS types of questions. If they also don't have a CS background, they're less likely to ask you those kinds of questions. Uh, it doesn't mean that they won't because they might be given questions or they might have gone through extra studying and things like that. But people who historically have a CS background, they're more likely to ask CS computer science related questions because that's their background. That's how they interviewed. That's how they're interviewing you. Some companies, though, do a really good job of training people to say like, hey, the person you're about to interview doesn't have a CS background. They're not going to be able to answer certain kinds of questions and that's okay. Um, and so hopefully they, they're kind of on board with, with what's going on. They don't act all smug about it or something. But um, so anyway, so I just wanted to mention that. So you have to do research on the person. Find out what's their education. How long have they been at the company? What other kinds of companies have they been at? And then you can ask them personal questions like, you know, what brought you to this company? What keeps you at this company? What do you like about working here? Um, is there anything you don't like about working here? They may not answer that, but they might. They might share a few things with you. Um, and then the second part of this question was like, um, how can you, how can you find out all this information to know if they're possibly going to let you down? And again, I'm, I'm curious if the wording on this means if you're going to get rejected. Um, but I think if you understand enough about them, you can build more of that collaborative conversation, which is what interviews should be. And I say this a lot on the stream interviews should be conversation, not interrogation. And so hopefully through researching that person and what they know and kind of their education background, you can find some kind of common ground with them to have just better conversation with them. And so it doesn't feel like I'm just going to sit here and I'm just going to wait for you to ask me a question. I'm going to answer that question and then hope you ask me another question. Uh, the best kinds of interviews are where I ask you a question, you answer it, and then that makes you ask me a question. And then I get to answer that and then ask you a follow-up question. It's, it's, it's a great feeling for us as interviewers when it feels interactive, where it's not just a one-way, you know, I'm going to ask you a question, you give me an answer, and now I ask you another question, you give me another answer. Um, and so any kind of research you can do on the person is going to help make that be a very collaborative kind of effort. What's up, Dota2? See you in chat. Um, Dota2 says in chat, Google has a really good video on how to interview properly. I was very shocked. Yeah, um, a lot of the fan companies are really good at sharing the details of this is what our interview process is going to be like. These are the kinds of questions we're going to ask. These is, you know, here's the, the specific study material we want you to go over. Um, and like, you need to go over that stuff. You need to be really aware of, of what they send you to, to study. It doesn't mean it's the only stuff you should study, but that's the bulk of what their interview is going to be. So if you study that material really well, you're going to be really well prepared. The more you can study above and beyond that, the better. But if that's all you have time to study, then you're still going to do really well in the interview. Um, so yeah, it is kind of surprising that, you know, the, the companies that we feel are the hardest ones to get into are the ones who are actually the most transparent about, yeah, you want a job here? Here's what you need to go learn and then come interview with us. Um, so yeah, I, I really have a lot of respect for any company that will put that kind of information out there or just answer simple questions like, what's your interview process like? What should I know? What can I not bother studying? Like, um, you know, are there specific kinds of topics that I should study? Are there things that I shouldn't bother, you know, spending my time on? Um, and like I said, some companies are, are better about sharing that content. Um, and, and I think more and more companies are starting to do that. 
cool good to see you dota too hope uh, hope your weekend's gone well um all right let's get to more questions I went to an engineering interview and I was asked the question, are you risky? How do I answer this question? That's a tough one. Um, risky in what way? Like, are you, you know, do you have like a lot of personally risky kind of behavior? Like, do you go skydiving and bungee jumping every weekend? Or are they talking risk like, you know, you like to patch code in production? Um, so I think that there's different kinds of risk Companies who are, um, you know, the, in in my experience, so just from my own experience, companies that are really small, if they hire you, you become a very important person to them because you're carrying a lot of responsibility. And so if you're doing a role like system administration or something like that, and they're like, okay, well, how quickly can you get down to the data center if we need you to like change a server or something like that? And you're like, yeah, it's no problem. I ride a motorbike. They're like, oh, that's risky. You know, what if you get in a crash on the way there? Like we need somebody there. So, you know, are you gonna get there safely? Um, I actually lost a job uh, opportunity one time in Los Angeles uh, based on how close I was to where the data center was. So I was applying for a DevOps job and they're like, well, you've got all the qualifications that we need. How far away do you live from this address? And I looked it up. And I'm like, oh, I'm about 45 minutes away. They're like, oh, that's a bit far. Would you be really willing to relocate closer? I'm like, well, no. And they're like, okay, well, we can't consider you then because if something goes wrong on the server, we need you there within like a 15 minute window. And I'm like, that's pretty hardcore, <laughs> um, you know, to, to have that kind of responsiveness because that means that you also can't go anywhere outside of a 15 minute travel window of that location. So even if you're going out with your friends and you get called and you're on, on call duty, uh, that phone rings, you gotta get to that data center. You have to literally drop everything you're doing to get there. Um, that's not a great environment to work in. Um, and so I didn't mind losing out on that job. So when it comes to answering a question about risk level, um, you really have to find out like what kind of risk are they asking about? Are they asking about like personal risk or are they asking about like development risk, uh, professional risk, you know, things like that. Um, I think that those are all good kinds of questions that you can kind of ask them to clarify about what that question is. So any kind of question, really, if you're not really sure what it is they're really trying to ask, you can say, could you rephrase that question? Because the wording of that is a little bit confusing to me and I'm not really sure how I should appropriately answer that. Um, it would be okay to, to ask that as, as a follow-up. Someone else asked, should I still expect a response, positive or negative, despite my poor performance in a, in a um, interview test that I did three weeks ago from a tech startup? Um, I would say if it's been three weeks and you haven't heard anything from them, uh, I would probably follow up one time and just say, hey, I'm looking for some feedback. But if you know that you had poor performance and it's been three weeks and you haven't heard anything, I would probably take that as a negative. But I would still want to find out just for my own satisfaction of like, okay, I'm just calling to make sure that I didn't get that job. I wouldn't word it that way. I would, I would send them an email and say, hey, I'm still really interested in the company. I know that my performance on that last interview um, wasn't my best but I'm still really interested in what's happening with the company and I'm just curious about getting some feedback. You can always ask them for feedback. They may not give you any, but you can still ask them. Um, I would say whenever you ask for feedback, if it's the first time you're asking for feedback, uh, wait a couple of days and if you don't get a response, send one more email asking for that feedback. And if you don't hear anything from that, usually that second email will make them think like, oh shoot, I meant to send that email to Ian and I, you know, excuse me, I procrastinated or something. So I'm going to send it right now. You're more likely to get a response from that second email. Not always. Um, if they also continue to ignore that one, um, if there's someone else that you've been networking with at the company, try reaching out to them and say, hey, I've been trying to get a hold of Ian at the company to get some feedback. Um, there, you know, I haven't had any response. I've emailed a couple of times. I've waited several days each time, not getting any response. Could you go ask them what's up? Um, you know, that kind of thing is totally okay to do uh, with somebody else. If you've been networking and, and done outreach to someone else at the company, you can always ask them, hey, can you go follow up with this other person? Because I really want to get some feedback. But if it's been several weeks and you haven't heard anything and you know it didn't go well, I mean, it would be nice to just get some closure on it and say, no, you didn't get the job. But uh, you, you won't really know unless you ask. And I know some people that are like, bug them until they tell you to go away. Um, and, and that can be fine too. 
So just ask, ask them for that feedback. Um, I would say, don't just sit back and expect that a company is going to reach out to you. They're busy. You know, if they've made offers, they might be waiting for someone to respond to an offer, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and so there may be scenarios where they just, they're so swamped with things that they're just not proactively sending feedback out to people, but you can always ask them and say, Hey, I interviewed a couple of weeks ago. I'd really like some feedback. And they're, they're more likely to send that if you request it. All right, this one is a little nebulous too. Someone asked, how do I increase the chances of getting called for a job interview? So we've talked about this on the stream a little bit. There are lots of different stages. So the first one is like, how do you apply for the job and then uh, you know, make that application enticing for somebody to call you, whether it's the cover letter, the resume and things like that. Your resume has to be in good shape so that your resume gets sort of, uh, it flags you as being a really good match for that particular role. So this is why you have to customize that resume um, so that these automated systems will kind of look for all these keywords and, and kind of line things up and go, yes, Ian is a good match for this job. Then they're more likely to at least take a look at your cover letter and, and your resume and your LinkedIn and maybe your GitHub and things like that to try to determine whether they want to call you. Um, from there, I mean, how do you increase that chance? I would say if, it, like, if you can do the networking, the outreach, for the job for that company, then you can always ask someone inside like, hey, could you put my name in or could you go ask HR about me? Like I've submitted an application for that job or I've applied for that thing online. Could you go ask HR about status? If you ask them for a favor before you even apply, that person might have to go to HR and say, hey, Ian wants to apply for this job. Can I give you his resume? They're gonna say, well, you can, but Ian's still going to have to go through our system because it's got to go through all these other things. So he's still going to have to apply anyway. Well, now you've already asked him for that favor. And then once you apply, you can ask him for another favor to say, hey, can you go ask HR about my application? So I would always ask for that favor after I've already applied. So apply for that job and then figure out like who you've already talked to at the company and ask them to go talk to HR and say, hey, my friend Ian submitted an application. Could you check it out? Um, could we get them in for an interview? Something along those lines. You're more likely to get a phone call that way. So that's one way to increase your chances. The other one is just make a really compelling case for yourself through your application. Um, you know, make sure that resume is customized very well for a particular job. Make sure that um, you know you've got things spelled correctly and that you look for the you look like the best candidate for that job. And then write a good cover letter. Uh, I covered a cover letter in a, in a previous video. I'll try to link it, uh, you know, either on the screen here somewhere, or I'll put it in the, in the show notes afterwards, but, um, I've got a whole video on just how to write a cover letter. Um, and then from there, like hopefully when they're looking at that, you're, you're making a very compelling reason for them to call you. All right, getting down to the end of this list, I've only got a couple more here, but uh, if you're in chat, feel free to drop questions in chat. Then I'm going to uh, hop over and do a couple of resume reviews here too. Um, do I mention needing time off for therapy in a job interview? If not, when do I ask them for time off? Uh, we've kind of covered this in other streams. It's none of their business. Um, it's none of their business to know that you need to go to therapy. Most companies are going to have some kind of benefits package. That benefits package hopefully will cover mental health, physical health. So if it's physical therapy like I do for my shoulder or mental therapy like you're going to, to talk to someone. Um, Point Light, thanks for the follow. Appreciate that. Uh, welcome to the stream. We're just doing uh, kind of general Q&A, but, uh, but welcome. If you've got questions about interview prep or uh, you know career coaching, things like that, drop it in chat. Uh, so to get back to this question, um, do I mention needing that time off for therapy? No, absolutely not. They can bias against you and you have no idea why. Um, and it's really hard to prove that they've biased against you because you've mentioned that you need time off for therapy. Uh, as a business, once you're hired, I can't stop you from going to therapy. So it's okay. So when do you ask for that time off? Well, once you get the job, once you actually start the job, then you can say, hey, cool, day one. I love, I love all this going on. By the way, I need to take Thursday afternoon off because uh, I, I go to a regular therapy session or something like that. They can't say no about that. Um, and if they give you a hard time about it, then now they're discriminating against you for that and you should talk to HR. But that's why companies have benefits packages. Use the benefits package. 
use the benefits that the, that you're paying for. Uh, you know, some of the some of the benefits actually comes out of your paycheck. So use it. Same thing with time off. Go use that time off. Use it before you need to use it to recover. Uh, I was mentioning on the on the stream the other night. Um, I saw something on Twitter recently that said use the time off to relax so that you don't need to use the time off to recover something along those lines if you, if you get kind of the point like you don't want to you don't want to get to the point of burnout and then needing to take that time off um, but I think that this is the kind of thing that you don't need to bring up in the interview in any way shape or form you don't have to mention anything along those lines any kind of like medical need uh, therapy family need any kind of personal information like that you don't want to bring up during the interview um, some of those kinds of things they're not allowed to ask about either. So you don't even have to worry about, well, what if they ask, then what do I say? You know, they, they shouldn't be asking that kind of stuff. Um, a lot of those things are none of their business. Um, and you can, you can defer and deflect on, on some of that stuff if it does come up. So when do you ask for the time off? You ask for the time off after you get the job and say, cool, these are the days that I go to regular therapy, um, you know, and, and I'll, I'll do my best to work around my schedule, make sure I'm getting my work done. I'm, it's not going to interfere with my job, but this is a regular thing that I've got going on. And uh, most companies are going to be very accommodating for that. All right, last two questions here. How would I interview for a job online? So this kind of contrast the difference between what's it like to do an interview in person and what's it like to do an interview over like teleconference software like zoom or google meet or something like that um, a lot of the interviews are going to be really the same thing it's just you're not there to actually shake somebody's hand and it's a little bit harder to read body language because everything's two-dimensional on the screen and usually it's just you know kind of like you know as much of my head that you can see right now so you don't get to see like you know am i am i crossing my arms or not you can't really tell um, unless you actually pay attention to my shoulders, right? Then my shoulders kind of come in a little bit if I cross my arms. Um, you can't tell whether I'm crossing my legs. You can't tell whether I'm, well, I mean, you can kind of tell if I'm sitting forward in my chair a little bit or not, but like, it's really hard to read body language over, over a teleconference software. Um, but aside from that, the interview is pretty much going to be the same. Um, I think the, the main things to take into consideration there are things like, uh, what kind of bandwidth do you have at home? Do you have really good upload and download speed so that the video is nice and crisp or, or at the very minimum that the audio is going to play through? Um, if you have the, the option in your browser, in your software to say, uh, you know, give more bandwidth to my audio than my video, do that because it's more important that they can hear your answers than see your face like super clearly and see that I've got freckles or not. Um, you know, it should be less about my freckles and more about the answers that I, that I give to their questions. So aside from, you know, the, the presentation side of things, um, you know, have really good bandwidth, have good lighting, good kind of background kind of thing. I mean, I know my background here is pretty dark. You don't have to have a super dark background. I would say don't, um, don't have your back to a window if sunlight is coming in the window, um, because having a really bright light or something super bright behind you could, uh, make it really hard to see your face. Um, depending on the type of webcam that you have or type of camera that you have. Um, so try to do it where the light is actually shining at you so they'll be able to see you better. Um, and, you know, even if you need like your own lights or something to, to set up, uh, but make sure that you're well lit and that your audio is really good. Um, it doesn't mean you have to go out and spend money on a good microphone or anything like that, but just, you know, make sure that if, if you're using a, a laptop, that you're maybe plugging in like a headset for a microphone or something like that. Test all of it ahead of time. If they're doing the call over Zoom, start Zoom yourself uh, like way ahead of time and record yourself on all the different microphones and then play back that recorded video and figure out which microphone sounds best. Like you can plug one in and go, you know, this is my headset microphone and this is my, you know, my Bluetooth headpiece microphone and this is my, you know, really nice quality studio microphone or this is my webcam with its microphone and then play that back and then just listen to your own voice and go actually i really like the quality of my voice when it's through this microphone then use that microphone um, same thing with audio you want to be able to hear them so i generally recommend headphones of some kind it doesn't have to be like the great big things that sit on your ears they can just be like regular sort of wired uh, headphones i don't really have a good set here to, to show i mean i kind of have this set it's a little buried under some heavy stuff but i can't look at those turn very well 
Um, you know, you can get just a wired set of headphones or something like that. Um, you know, but plug them in, try them, make sure they work, and then set them aside so that they don't get lost. Like put them like right next to your computer or something like that. So that when it's time for the interview, about 10 minutes ahead, plug that stuff in, do another quick Zoom call with yourself, record like, yes, my microphone's working, or some of them will have like a, a thing where you say, test my audio, and it records a few seconds of your microphone and then plays it back. Make sure you can hear yourself. Um, and then when you join the call, make sure you're unmuted, that you're ready to go, you're prepared, you have your notebook ready, you know, stuff like that. Um, so when you're interviewing for a job online, uh, my tendency is to just type notes. That way I can kind of keep looking at the camera so it looks like I'm paying attention to them. And I'll generally have a window where their face is in one window right near the camera. Um, and so what you don't want to do is you don't want to move that window down to the bottom of the screen. And so while you're watching them, you're kind of talking to them on this screen over here, but the camera's up over here. And so you need to kind of imagine that you're making eye contact with them. And so you need to look at the camera so that it looks like you're talking to them. And so what I would do is I would actually move that window right underneath the camera. And so when you see their face, it looks like you're looking at them. That would be my number one thing. You want it to kind of appear like you're making eye contact. Um, and then any kind of notes or whatever, I would put in a window right next to that. So even when I'm writing notes, it still kind of looks like I'm looking at them and paying attention to them. But you can certainly say like, hey, I'm just going to be like typing up some notes as we go, if that's okay. Um, but you want to make sure that it, it feels like you're making eye contact with them as much as possible. Not like super staring mode, like you don't want to like, you know, gaze lovingly into their eyes or anything like that. Like you don't want to be creepy about it, but just, you know, that you're approximately looking in, in their direction um, as part of that interview. So that would, those would be a couple of tips. Um, as far as like dress code, you know, do you wear a ball cap? I wouldn't. Um, I would actually dress business casual the same as you would for an in-person interview. Um, just because you're at home doesn't mean you got to be in sweatpants and, and a tank top or something like that. Like dress the part. You you still need to impress them to some degree. Be yourself. So wear what's comfortable for you, but it should be business casual if you're interviewing. Um, that's kind of my fallback and my go-to. Uh, would I even wear a shirt like this with stripes on it? I probably wouldn't. I would probably wear just a solid color shirt. Uh, but again, that's my own preference. Um, but I wouldn't wear a hat. Um, you know, like you, you don't want to, you don't want to distract them from things. Um, and so you, you need to be yourself, but you also need to be professional about it too. Um, so business casual would be the way to go. And then just make sure you're speaking clearly as much as possible. And if you start to notice, uh, you know, that they're asking you, Hey, could you repeat that? That kind of like got a little bit garbled. Maybe it's a, a bandwidth issue that you need to be aware of. Um, you can always ask them like, Hey, I know we've been talking for a couple minutes and we kind of, we've seen each other's faces, like just to make the audio better. Would it be okay if I turn off my video for a few minutes just to make sure that the audio is coming through? Uh, most of them will be like, yeah, that'd be fine to try for a little while. Some things though, they still want to see your face. They still want to know that, you know, you're still there. Um, but sometimes you can kind of adjust the bandwidth that you use. Like I want to give less bandwidth to my video and I want to give more bandwidth to my audio. So check the software that you use um, and see whether that's a possibility. Um, other things, uh, home networking, like home routers and so on, uh, sometimes have something called quality of service or QOS. Um, see if there's a setting in that for teleconference software. Um, and what it does is it prioritizes the packets of information that your computer is sending to the internet where it says, hey, this packet of data that I'm sending contains video and audio. So it needs, it needs more priority to process this instead of that file that's being downloaded or you know some other connection thing that's going on. Um, and so you can check for those kinds of things as well. Sometimes that can speed things up. Um, worst case scenario, if your bandwidth is kind of lousy, I mean, you can go find another location. Um, I would not do an interview at like a coffee shop because generally there's a lot of background noise for something like that. And so you do want to be careful, uh, again, with distractions. You just don't want to be super distracting. Like Riker, who wanted to come and visit? Come on, get up here and visit. Say hi to everybody. Um, so yeah, just try not to be super distracting um, during, during the interview. So I, I would recommend not doing it at a coffee shop. Um, if you can find like the you know, a quiet corner of like a bookstore, like a Barnes and Noble or 
or uh, you know whatever like try to try to find some place that's going to have bandwidth like a library but you don't want to be super loud and noisy either because interviews are going to go for an hour maybe several hours and you don't want to be that person in the corner of the back of the store and have the store say excuse me you need to you know keep your voice down kind of thing you don't want that to happen during an interview and go oh sorry i actually have to leave here and find somewhere else to continue the interview that's also super embarrassing so um, you know, if you, if you need a place with better bandwidth, try to arrange that like way ahead of time or just let them know, Hey, you know what? My bandwidth at home is a little shaky. Um, you know, I'm going to try to arrange for, you know, hanging out at a library or something, um, just so that they're aware of what's going on. It's okay to tell them that kind of stuff. All right. Last question on the list. Uh, again, if you are in chat and you've got questions about job hunt, interview prep, um, any kind of question about that kind of stuff, uh, please drop it in chat. I'm happy to take questions as we go. I got one more question here and then I'm going to get into two resume reviews. Um, one of them will be more anonymous than the other, uh, just the way that they prepared the resume. They thought they anonymized everything, but they missed something vital, uh, but that's all right. Um, and so I'm going to get to the last question, then we'll get into some resume reviews and then we can just chat. Like if you've got other, uh, other job related questions, let's, uh, let's chat. Let's bring that up too. I'm going to take a little water break here for a sec. All right. Last question. Uh, this one is pretty specific, but um, I, I'm going to kind of generalize it a little bit after I kind of present the question. So the question is, what are the likely questions to be asked by interviewers as a mobile app developer and as a web developer? Um, and so I'm going to kind of make this more generic and say, what are the likely questions to be asked for blank developer? Fill in the blank. Are you a web developer? Are you a mobile app developer? Are you a systems developer? Like, what kind of developer are you? I think that there are a range of questions that are going to get asked kind of no matter what. And then there are going to be what we call domain specific questions that you're going to be asked based on what you do or what that role particularly is. If it's a mobile app job, you're going to get asked questions about mobile application development. If it's web development, you're going to get asked about, you know, HTTP lifecycle and, you know, HTTP status codes and, you know, how the web works and things like that. Um, if it's like system level, you're going to get asked questions about operating systems and permissions and, and things like that. So it really depends on the, on the type of development role that you're going for. But there are going to be kind of generic questions that they could ask about just technology in general, uh, no matter what. And so again, it comes down to being prepared for these kinds of things. Now you can go find lists of questions online. So I'm not gonna try to pretend like I'm, I've got like the top thousand questions, you know, ready to go off the cuff. But there are going to be common questions that, um, that you can look up online. There's gonna be tons and tons of resources out there. The daily email series that, that I produce, um, that I email out every day, I address a handful of these really popular questions but I don't really go into the technical explanation of them. Instead, what I do is I kind of talk about why I asked that question as an interviewer. Like, why is that question important to me? Uh, or what am I trying to get out of you, uh, you know, by asking that kind of question? What am I trying to find out about you? Um, so when it comes to these kinds of questions, like what are the likely questions I'm going to get asked for a type of development? Um, I would say there, there are generic kinds of things that you're gonna have to know. Um, but it's also going to depend a little bit on the type of development you do. So if, if you're doing, say, mobile development, um, you know, you're going to get asked very specific things about the differences between iOS and Android. Do you write your code in Java or Kotlin or do you write it in iOS or uh, Objective-C or Swift? Like what language do you use? What frameworks do you use? Uh, you know, you're going to get asked very specific sorts of questions about that, but you may also get asked just general, like user interface, user experience kinds of things. Like, what do you think is a good interface? Would you rather swipe left and right or swipe up and down? Uh, you know, you could get asked those kinds of questions as well. Again, it depends on whether you're doing like mobile UI development or if you're doing like kind of the, you know, uh, what we would call kind of middle middleware where it's somewhere between the user interaction and actually sending out to like some backend service. There's going to be like some code in between. Are you that developer? Um, if you're more on the system side of it, they're going to ask questions about, well, what is REST? What's a RESTful API? What are some other choices of, of API development that are not REST? Um, do you know about those like gRPC? Um, you know, 
do you are you aware of those kinds of things um, do you only use JSON data payloads have you ever used protocol buffers like those are gonna be more of the low-level kinds of things uh, for very front-facing customer facing kinds of interfaces you're gonna get you could get asked things about accessibility and color schemes and color blindness and, and things like that so the the kinds of questions you're going to get asked are going to be specific to the type of role but then they're also going to be asking kind of these generic questions about why do you want this job here at this company? Why should I hire you? Sorts of questions. Um, but they're also going to want to ask like pretty much all of those interviews. They're going to ask like about your aspirations. Like what what kind of developer do you want to be? Like this is the role we want to try to hire for. But are you really headed in the same direction or do you want to kind of veer off and do something else after a while? Like do you want to do this job for two years and then get into management? Um, do you want to do this job for a couple of years and then, you know, work on a different part of the stack? Like maybe you work on that middleware and you want to gravitate more towards systems or maybe you're on systems and you want to, you know, move all the way up to the front end and, and be more sort of full stack. Um, those kinds of questions are going to get asked no matter what kind of developer you are. Um, and so I think that there are generic questions that you could go look up, but then there are also going to be very domain specific kinds of questions. Um, so hopefully that'll give uh, a couple of ideas there. Um, the kinds of questions that you're going to face are also going to depend on your seniority level. If you're brand new in the industry, you're not going to get asked super hard questions or super detailed, like intricate kinds of questions, like the best way to do caching. Uh, you know, they may ask, like, have you ever done caching if you're entry level? And if you're more senior level, they're like, tell me about a time that you've done some caching. What were some trade offs that you made? What are some different ways that you can cache data? Uh, what are the trade-offs that we make around processing time versus memory storage and things like that? That's going to tip more into like senior level uh, territory. So again, those kinds of things will, will depend a lot on uh, the role and your seniority level as well as the company themselves. Um, and as we, as we mentioned like really early in the, in the stream, um, some of the questions will also depend a little bit on the interviewer themselves. If they come from that CS background, they're more likely to ask more CS-based questions. Um, it's not guaranteed, but I would still try to be prepared for some, just in case. All right, well, that's it for those questions. Uh, if there's anything else uh, that anybody wants to drop in chat, I'm happy to address any other questions there. Otherwise, I'm going to hop into some resume reviews, and uh, we'll go through uh, a couple of these. All right, so one of them is not anonymized at all. Um, and it is three pages long. And the other one is, uh, they tried to be anonymous, um, but they missed one detail and, um, and it's only a single page. So I wanna kind of go through the differences between multi-page resumes and one-page resumes and kind of the differences between them. So I'm gonna start with the multi-page resume. Uh, let me make sure that this is going to work out okay. So I'm gonna switch my scene over to here. All right, so this is the multi-page uh, resume, and this person did not anonymize it at all. Um, so uh, apologies to them for uh, exposing their name and email and things like that to the general internet, but um, but that is what uh, what that form is for. So let's dive in. Um, so we got their name. They are a PHP developer. I like just putting I'm this type of developer. I'm a web developer. I'm a mobile app developer without saying like i'm a junior developer i'm a senior developer you don't have to necessarily call that out in your title you're just you're a developer that's what you are so make that your title um, they got their email address up here they got a github link they've got code mentor to io um, link as well and these are actually all links we can kind of see the, the little highlight down the bottom of the uh, browser window um, showing that those links are going to work properly um, and then they've got a, a pretty big sort of introduction and then um, they've got a lot of work in the United States. So they've got New York, they've got California, and then they've got the UK, Belgium, uh, other previous experience certifications and so on. So this, this list kind of goes on for a little while. Now people in the UK, they use what they call a curriculum vitae or CV. And a CV in the UK is going to be multiple pages. And generally what they aim for on that CV is like, tell me everything they want to be able to read through this and get all of the information or as much information about you as they can before they have to interview you. Um, and so the CV is something where they actually want to see a lot of information. Um, and so 
anytime you get a sort of a resume from someone from Europe, it's more than likely going to be many, many pages and it's going to have like a larger summary. Um, some, uh, some countries I've noticed are more uh, likely to have like a headshot on there of some kind um, and lots and lots and lots of information about them in that role. Um, it's not 100% necessary um, to, to have all that information for the North American style resume screening um, and, and jobs. And so the first question I would ask this person coaching them on like building up this resume is, are you looking for a job back in the UK or are you looking for a job in North America? If you're looking for a job in North America, you need to trim this back down to one page. Um, and that's going to mean taking some of the stuff off and you can explain it during the interview. If you're looking for a job back in the UK, you may actually want to make this even longer. I've seen UK resumes that are like eight or nine pages long, um, where it's literally every project at every job they've ever worked ever, every single possible skill and when they last used it. Um, and so there's there's a big difference between a, uh, like a European CV and a North American resume. Um, and so I did, I kind of wanted to show that, that contrast in here. Um, all right, so let's dive in and look at this. So, you know, I am this name. I'm a software engineer at this company with more than seven years of experience. So, I mean, this almost starts to read a little bit like a cover letter. Um, and, and again, with a CV, this is this is typical. You put a big, like, introduction uh, about yourself on that CV. Fast experience in building robust, scalable, test-driven, performant web apps. I'm an advocate for TDD. Well, you already told me test-driven, and then you're mentioning TDD again. Um, you've already talked about performance and scalability, which are best practices. Um, design patterns is kind of a generic term, but this sentence here feels pretty redundant. You've already told me a lot of this stuff already. Um, bouncing back up here for a sec. So I've worked with these companies in the UK, uh, currently work for so-and-so in New York, help to build the application and so on for nonprofit boards. Okay. I also write serverless functions, also capable of architecting database designs and building optimize SQL queries. So there's a grammar error here. This should be optimized past tense. Um, I have, I'm capable of architecting and building optimized SQL queries. Um, so this is okay to put in as, as kind of a, a way to get started. But again, you gotta be careful about grammar and stuff like that too. So um, now the difference with the, the European CV in my experience, so I've only screened a, a handful of these in my career. And so again, these are just my own opinions on this. Um, when I look at a CV, I still am, I'm still trying to get at the same goal that I have when I'm screening a North American resume. Does this person have the skill that I need for this job that I'm trying to hire for right now? And so for me, I would want to see all of these skills that you've got on this last page. I would want to see all of this up on that first page because that's the most important thing I'm trying to get out of this. If I got to go through page after page after page to find out whether you have that skill, I'm already less interested in reading through your whole resume um, because you've made me go hunt for all this information. So as much as possible, you want to try to, um, I think, in my opinion, again, put these skills up on the, on the first page. Uh, maybe even the certifications. I would put the certifications up on page one as well. Uh, let's see, Dota is saying in chat, Selenium and Cypress is not usually TDD. Yeah, I agree. I mean, well, yes and no. I mean, Selenium, you're really writing those tests ahead of time. Um, and so you're, you're writing the behavior of what you wanted to do ahead of time so that it could run as a, as a test. Um, but it's actually running it in a real browser. So tools like Selenium, it actually pops up in a browser and you can actually see it clicking on things and dragging things around. It's actually pretty neat to watch. Um, or you could do what we call headless mode where it's just doing it in a process in the background and it runs really fast because the browser doesn't actually have to render anything. Um, but you can still kind of take a test-driven approach where you write that test and say, this is what I expect to happen. Now I'm going to make sure that that test doesn't work. Now I'm going to go build the app so that that test does work. So you can still take a TDD approach, but uh, I also agree that in my experience working with Selenium, it tends to be testing after the fact. Um, so you can kind of TDD the application, but then when you're building out those integration level tests, you can build them with Selenium to say, this is the behavior that we want to have happen. And you're more proving that this is actually what's happening in the application as opposed to like a strict TDD uh, kind of process. 
Um, let's see, if he's using those suites, uh, I'd put behavior-driven development. Yeah, if he's doing TDD, I'd leave out those suites. Okay. Yeah, so everyone's going to have uh, different opinions, but Dota, I appreciate you dropping that stuff in, in chat for sure. Hopefully uh, hopefully, this person that sent me the resume will uh, will read up on the chat here as we go. Um, I will say it's a very small percentage of managers that know the difference. Yeah, I agree, um, and and even less so for HR people. They may have some indication of, you know, look for this technology, look for that technology as guided by, uh, you know, folks in the engineering department. Um, but it does depend a lot on the engineering manager and what their background is. If they've got a background as a developer, they're going to know that difference. If they've gone through like, uh, like business school or something to get that management role, they're less likely to have that level of technical training. So yeah, you're right. Those folks would not know the difference or, or less likely to know the difference. Um, all right, well, let's get back to the resume here. So they got their career summary. Um, they've got this first job here. Um, again, you'll hear me say this on the stream a lot. I'm not a big fan of these vertical bars to separate things. Um, it does kind of interrupt your reading a little bit. Um, and so I think that those are, uh, you know, those should probably just get taken out and leave it as either white space or put a comma in there. Um, till date, uh, a little confusing. Does that mean this is like, you know, to present date? Um, I would probably change that and say like 2018 to present. But at the same time, like when you just say 2018, I don't know, was that like the end of 2018? And so you've got all of 2019, 2020, and most of 2021. So you've got three years experience. Or was this at the beginning of 2018? And now you've got that fourth year of experience because you've got all of 2018, 2019, 2020, and most of 2021. So there's a bit of a difference between three years experience and four years experience. And so I would be... I would actually coach this person, like put a month on there of when did you start at this job. Um, also, knowing that you're a freelancer is fine too, but again, I would put months on here as well and just say, um, you know, this this is a present kind of role. Now, they do write this in present tense. I mentor developers around the world. Um, but a lot of the language up here is past tense. I managed this. I improved this. I built this single-handedly drove. So there's a lot of past tense language actually pretty much everything I'm seeing about their their current role um, as this web developer role is all written in the past tense where um, they're talking very clearly about present tense for this particular job. Now, if this was like, well, this was a project that I did at that job two years ago, then of course that's past tense if you're not still working on that project. And so there, there is some give and take uh, in here that, that you can kind of consider as you're, as you're thinking about the tense of the language, present tense versus past tense. Um, but try to just be be aware of that as you're building that out. Um, for me, again, bullet points should not wrap onto multiple lines. If you've got that much to say, um, I would break these into multiple bullet points, um, or I would reduce the number of bullet points completely and and just not have uh, not have this many bullet points. Um, and I would at best, um, what I would do is I would try to cut it off right around here. So right around where that date is. Um, you kind of want to cut it off right around here. So if we kind of think about what happens then is these dates over here would kind of end up in a, in a kind of a sort of column by themselves because there wouldn't be any of this text underneath it. Um, and so they stand out more. It's easier to see those dates. Now they did put bold on the date and so it does make it easier to kind of pull those things out. But there's a lot of overlap on here. Like they started this job in 2018 and this job on the second page was also 2018. So did those overlap at all or did one end and then the other one started right away? Or, you know, what if they quit this job in January of 2018 and they didn't start this job until December of 2018? Like, did they do anything that year? Um, like, was there other stuff that might have overlapped that? Did they do a lot more freelance work in that year? Like, so there's a lot of questions about the dates on here. So I would definitely put some months on here as much as possible, but I would trim up these, uh, these bullet points. Now, this person has done a really good job quantifying information on here. You know, they reduced, you know, or they improved this by 80%, um, you know, or they, you know, improved overall loading time by 20, 50, et cetera, records um, by doing uh, like some prefetching and, and so on. So they do a pretty good job quantifying some information on there. Um, but I think, you know, bullet points don't have to be full grammatically correct sentences, especially for a North American resume. So I think you could trim up this text quite a bit. Um, I'm also a little bit curious about the font size as well. The font up here for their for their contact information is a little bit smaller font than the content on the page itself. 
um, and the content of, of this actually feels larger than the content of the title and the name of the company, I would make all of this stuff one font size. I would make all of this like 10 point font. Um, now that's gonna compress everything quite a bit and it's no longer gonna be three pages. It'll probably be two pages and maybe trickle into a third page. Um, but I think you could also like tighten up these skills a little bit too. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, so as far as like laying these things out, I would definitely shorten those bullet points. Um, again, for a North American resume, for, for a, a European CV, you do want to explain a lot of information in here because they are going to take the time to read the whole thing. Um, there are aspects of it that they're just going to kind of scan over and screen over. Um, but they're, you know, it's certainly not the six second to 10 second kind of timeline that a North American resume is going to have like a human kind of scanning over it really quick. Um, but I think you could still trim it up. Also looking at the margins, uh, looking at the bottom margin here, they're really pushing this bottom margin and then the top margin on the second page is also right at the top of the page. I would probably add a little bit more padding around the, the edges of the page. Um, again, it looks like you've made those margins much wider to try to fit more content on the page. And that does make it a little harder to read, like scanning across the whole width of the page uh, to read text that especially that wraps across uh, is, is actually going to be harder to read. Um, and then getting down to this last job at Belgium, again, they're doing a good job quantifying things, but a lot of the other same sorts of things would, uh, would apply here. And then they list just a handful of other sort of previous experience, um, Nigeria uh, as well. So they've got a handful of, of things in Nigeria. Now from a white space point of view um, and, and sort of how they've spaced things out, um, I would probably tighten the white space a little bit. Like there's a pretty big gap in between web developer and the start of these bullet points. I would probably move that bullet point right underneath there and start these right away. Um, and then when you get down to the previous experience, again, I think you could pull these like all the way up. But then there's not a lot of white space between this heading, which is all caps, and this heading, which is mixed capitalization and lowercase. If we come back up here, career summary is also mixed case. Professional summary is also mixed case. So why is previous experience all caps? So again, it's a, it's a consistency thing. Same thing with certifications. Um, it's okay to list all of these different things, but be consistent about how you're writing it. So the first thing I would do, like if I had this in a Google Doc, I would just highlight all the text, make everything 10 point. And then I would go back in and I would make their, their name one size of font. I would make all of these titles, so their job title as well as all these headings, I would make them another size and I would leave everything else the same size of font on the page. So generally their name would be like a 20 point font. This title and these headings, I would do like maybe 12 to 14 point font and everything else, all this other content on the page other than these other headers would just be 10 point font. When it comes to the skills down here at the bottom, I would actually do, uh, instead of these vertical lists with all of this empty space in between, I would find a way to make this a little more compact where you can still show the kinds of frameworks that you've used with PHP and the frameworks that you've used with, uh, with JavaScript, um, but do it in a way that uh, kind of groups them up a little bit better. Uh, for example, Node.js isn't a coding language, it's a framework. Um, and so that needs to be put over here on this side. Um, HTML and CSS, yeah, I mean, they're, they're languages. Are they a programming language? Eh, it's debatable. ES6 is part of JavaScript. So um, if you're gonna call out ECMAScript 6, I would probably put that next to JavaScript. Um, you know, and then if you wanna list TypeScript on its own, that's fine. Um, but are you doing like ES5 and you know ES6? So I would put both of those together. Also, MySQL is not a language, neither is AWS. So you're kind of grouping things in a, in a strange way. AWS would actually belong under DevOps. MySQL, I would also put under DevOps as well. Um, and then um, a lot of the testing things you've got in here, like Selenium, Jest, Cypress, um, I, would actually, I would actually make another whole heading just, you know, you've called out test-driven development in that summary at the very top. I would actually make a header just for software testing and list all of these things. And as Dota was saying in chat, maybe list behavior-driven testing or uh, behavior-driven development in there as well. Um, I think that that could be beneficial too. Um, just checking chat again. Uh, some of those bullet points seem like a day-to-day -day thing. Some of them seem examples of exceeding expectations, yeah. Um, I think it's, it's still good to explain the day-to-day -day responsibilities, especially at jobs that they're currently at. 
Um, so I, I think that there's there's definitely a balance to uh, to put in there, like maybe current responsibilities and previous projects or something like that. You can almost make like a subheader. Again, for these for these European UK uh, or uh, European CVs, you can add a lot of content that we typically would not include on a North American resume. Um, and so you could make subheaders for the job and say, these are my current responsibilities and these were my previous you know, projects or previous responsibilities, things along those lines. So I think that, um, again, if it's meant to be a CV, they could do both. If it was meant to be um, like a North American resume, I would probably just list the projects on there and talk about the job uh, when they actually get to the interview. Um, Yeah, just going through, looking at some other stuff from Dota and Chad about uh, having a year gap on your resume. I think we talked about that the last time uh, I saw you on the stream, Dota, where we were talking about, like, how do you handle that one year gap? Uh, hopefully that that was helpful. Um, there were only four companies I was applying to in town. Yeah, so again, it depends a little bit on are you applying for jobs only where you live or are you applying for jobs remotely and how do you kind of juggle that? Um, ES6 is a weird one. ES2020 is the latest one. Yeah, but if they haven't learned ES2020, then you know you don't want to put something on the resume that they haven't, um, that they haven't, uh, you know, had a, enough experience to actually speak to in an interview. So remember that as well. Anything you list on the resume is fair game. Um, anything on you know that you list as a language, as a skill, as a framework, as a tool, I should be able to ask you any kind of question about that. Now, if you only want to answer specific kinds of questions about it, then you can kind of frame that a little bit differently as far as your responsibility. Like if you list MySQL under DevOps, am I going to wonder, like, do you know how to set up MySQL and you know everything about like setting up permissions and things like that and like sharding and, uh, you know, like replication and things like that? Or are you only a user of MySQL where you can create tables and maybe indexes and you know how to like fetch and save data? because um, there's a big difference between those skill sets. So those would be things that I would probably specifically call out if I was going to list my SQL on a resume. Um, you know, do I list that as um, like user level knowledge versus like operations level knowledge? Um, and so I might, I might call those kinds of things out a little bit differently. Like having Nginx under DevOps, that tells me that you know how to set up Nginx and you know how to set up the rules and the routing and things like that. Same thing with Docker. Um, but when it comes to MySQL, like, are you just a user of MySQL or do you actually know how to set up MySQL? Um, so I think, again, you could you could probably group these skills in a, in a different way to kind of get that point across there. All right, cool. Um, so I think that's pretty much it for that resume review. Um, the other thing that was a little confusing here is, again, they, they kind of switch over to this really tiny font. They start getting into really tiny font and they do start mentioning months. Um, but this font is a completely different size. Um, and it also maybe looks like a different style of font as well. Um, but you're also switching to a two column kind of thing where you don't really do two columns elsewhere. Like these are kind of two columns, but they're also very different as far as like where that column is split. Like when we look at these pages back to back, you know, this one kind of splits right down the middle. This one splits almost like a 60-40. Uh, sort of split as far as like the width of what these columns would be. So I think you could do a little bit better, um, you know, like put all these dates out on that right margin, similar to how you've done these dates out on the right margin. Um, you know, I would just keep all the dates out on the right or something like that. Um, so hopefully that'll help. And yeah, I think we'll call that one done. Yeah, it's going to take a little, little water break here. How's everybody else doing? Notice a couple other people drop by the chat. Um, drop questions in chat. So I've got, I did, uh, I started out with some Q&A and just going through a couple of quick resume reviews before we call it a night. But if you do have questions, uh, I'm happy to uh, take those questions. All right, well, let's dive in. So speaking of operations, I had to do, uh, I had to do a whole like overhaul of my hosting platform where I do my daily email series uh, hosting had to kind of go through and rebuild all of that today to fix some bugs. Uh, so that was kind of a, a fun distraction. I hadn't, uh, hadn't gotten uh, my hands dirty on the operations side in quite a while. All right, so this next one, um, they tried to anonymize it, but uh, pay no attention to the name of the tab up at the top. Otherwise, it shows, uh, shows their name. Um, but we'll pretend that, uh, that Brian didn't, uh, 
and do that on the resume. Um, all right, so here's the second one. This is more of a North American style resume where it's down to one page. There is a lot of content on here. So again, typically what I like to do is I like to kind of zoom out and get a feel for the balance on the page. I do like the dark, the darker blue. Um, it's not as dark, I don't think, as like what they've actually got is their name. Uh, the curly brace uh, initially was a little bit confusing to me because the only one that really stood out was the one next to all of this blank space down at the bottom. So I noticed this one. I'm like, why is this down here? They're trying to draw attention to this stuff down here at the bottom of the page before I realized that this one existed up here at the top. Um, and so, again, you know, is that kind of thing necessary? Nah. I mean, it, it does kind of stand out like, oh, okay, that's kind of a, a neat kind of thing if you're into like JSON or something like that. Um, is it super necessary? No, I would typically take that kind of thing as well as all these icons. I would ditch all of those. I would also ditch these little boxes on here as well. It's just taking up space. Um, and it makes having having these things with all these bullet points where they're not in, in strict column width actually makes this a little bit harder to kind of read and see things. Um, and so I think that there's a, a better way of sort of laying out these skills. The other thing you'll notice, uh, because this is a PDF, as I start to highlight text and kind of drag across the page, notice it. Well, I don't know whether you'll be able to notice, but I'm, as it highlights all of the word technical skills, I want to try to drag it over Ruby and Rails. But as soon as I drag down into Rails, it didn't highlight any of Ruby. Um, and as soon as I start highlighting an R spec, it highlighted Postgres and Travis CI down here. Um, my worry with this is if I try to copy this whole block, um, that this isn't going to play well. So what I would typically do is hit control a on the page or command a on a mac uh, so i'm just going to try that here see if that's going to work for me so i'm going to hit control a and then i'm going to copy what i'm going to do is i'm going to pull this into an editor and what i want to do is i actually want to see what this is going to look like in an editor if i paste all this text into uh into just a plain editor and just just to show you what an automated or what an, uh, the automated trafficking system uh, might see this as. So let me let me get my code editor up here. Where's my code? There's my code. So this is a cut and paste of the text off the resume. And so if we scroll all the way back up to the top, this is this is just the raw text copied and pasted onto this page. So it's definitely going to pick up keywords. Like it's going to see like, oh, Heroku is in here. Bootstrap is in here. But notice education has all these spaces in between. Software engineer has all of these spaces in between. And so if I search in here for software engineer, I see that you're, you've got a certificate in software engineering but that's the only hit on the page. So it's a good thing that your certification is called software engineering um, because you know that didn't come out from that, uh, from that heading up here um, because of how you've actually written that on the page where it's like spacing this stuff out. And so this can be one danger of using different kinds of tools for these is when it's producing the PDF, is it actually producing the text in a readable way, um, like awards? Like if I was trying to find somebody that received awards if I search this for awards, I get no hits. Technically the word is on there, but because of the white space on there, um, it's actually not finding it. So just be aware of, of those kinds of things. Um, and then, you know, you got contact me, but then the email is actually above that. Um, and then the phone number and then LinkedIn, work experience and so on. Um, and then again, you with the vertical bars, um, Again, just my own preference. I like to not use vertical bars. Um, they do a pretty good job with their dates on here, but again, I would like to see the dates with months in there as well. So just to kind of give you an idea, like when an applicant tracking system is like, if it's scraping that PDF for text, this is what it's seeing. Um, now, it's not necessarily a bad thing because applicant tracking systems, they're just automated and they're looking for keywords like, Oh, you want Rails? Well, let's search for Rails in here. Yes, Rails is a hit. Uh, let's go search for, uh, you know, MongoDB. Well, there's no hits for MongoDB. Let's go search for uh, the word REST. I do see REST. Um, if I search for RESTful, I don't see it. But if I see, you know, I do see REST in there. So if I'm searching for someone with Rails experience building REST APIs, 
Um, I'm seeing that if I type the word API, I see third party API consumption. Uh, one of them with a capital C, one of them without a capital C. So again, be consistent on that stuff. Um, but this is what an applicant tracking system is kind of going to see as it's scraping through that PDF looking for text. Um, and so uh, just be aware of that. So let's switch back over to the browser and let's, uh, let's kind of dive back in and take a look at what else they got on the page here. Let's so see if I can unhighlight, there we go. Um, again, I'm not a big fan of having your geography on the resume, they can bias against you if you're trying to get a job in a specific location you don't already live there. Um, and so if you're looking for a job in that city and in that state, then you can put that on there if you already live there. If you're looking to relocate there, you can put uh, that city and state. So they think that you're local. And when they say, when do you want to start the job? And say, well, I'm actually in the process of relocating there right now. Um, so, I, you know, I can start in a couple of weeks or something like that. Um, you definitely want your phone number on there. Definitely want your email address on there. Um, but I would, I would drop the icons. I don't know that icons are really necessary for, for something like this. Technical skills. Um, so applicant tracking systems, there, it also puts sort of a weight uh, and a priority on left column versus right column. And things in the right column carry more weight than what's in the left column. The fact that all of your technical skills are over here on this left column means uh, applicant tracking system may not give it as much priority as keywords that it sees over here on the right side. So just something to be aware of. It is something that I've heard in passing from, uh, from people talking about uh, applicant tracking systems. So you may wanna move these skills over here at the very top. Now, in this case, you've got all of your work experience and you've got your education, you've got your projects over here. But again, when I'm looking at your resume, my eyes are gonna take the path of least resistance. And that usually means the easier contrast to read. And for me, that's gonna be dark text on a white background. By having the darker blue with white text, you're naturally drawing my eye, my human eye to the right side of the page. And it's really hard for me to see here that you've got the experience that I'm looking for for a particular role to fill. And so if you're applying for that entry level job, you probably want your skills and your projects over here on the right side of the page because that's the first thing that my eye is gonna be drawn to. Or it might draw through the contact information because this is less compact than this text over here with the work experience. Um, and so you're kind of drawing my eye across your contact and then down into the jobs and I'm gonna to continue to kind of come down this way. And so I'm, I'm gonna end up missing a lot of the, the project work and things like that over here. So I would probably rearrange this. Again, this is just my own opinion. I'd probably put the skills and the projects as the, as the top half of this page. Now, how important are these other jobs? Um, again, bullet points shouldn't be multiple lines. I would try to reduce those I, and if necessary, reduce the font size. Don't go smaller than 10 point, but make this 10 point font. See if you can condense uh, the bullet points down to be, um, you know, one line, you know, taking up, you know, most of the most of the space. Like see if you can bring these bullet points back a little bit instead of having uh, all of this extra white space in here if you really need to, you know, have the words on there. Um, I mean, from a from an overall like layout point of view and aesthetics point of view, it's a nice layout. Um, but I think that there's there's a lot of text over here on this right side of the page that um, that they're just not going to read. Like they're not going to sit here and read like multiple multiple lines of text. They just want quick bullet points. When when your eye um, speed reads bullet points, you're only picking up the first five or six words anyway. And so you're missing all of this stuff on the second half of the line anyway. So that's why I recommend, like, don't make your bullet points super long. They're not going to see the text anyway. They're, they're consciously not going to pick up those words. So make those bullet points short. Um, ideally, you want to make it about halfway across the page, at most about two-thirds across, like, the width of that container. But you certainly don't want to go all the way across. You certainly don't want to wrap multiple lines. Um, so that's just my own my own take on that. Um, but yeah, for me, I would put the technical skill and the projects and your technical training on the right side because that's the most important stuff for me uh, for hiring for that kind of role. Awards, it's great to have awards on there. Um, I would say if, if some of this stuff is not as important, like, um, you know, it's, it's important to show that you've been employable, but I don't know that you need to call it out on the right side of the page. I would put these jobs over here on the left side. Um, if you've got space, so I would have... Uh, me personally, I would put your skills and then your projects and then your training. And if you have time at the bottom, 
I would put your military service uh, on here. Again, I think you could reduce some of this a little bit um, because this is part of who you are, but this isn't your role now. And so I don't know that you need to explain your military background in quite so much text. I think you can compress it, not reduce it. I wanna be careful not to use the word reduce because I don't want you to think that I'm saying it's not important. But I think you could compress it in a way that you're not, you don't have to explain as much about these roles um, but I think it's a good thing to have on a resume. If you've got military experience, put the military experience on here and you can put it down at the bottom of the right side of the page. But get your, get your skills up top, get your projects under that, get your education under that. So I wanna see like, what have you done? Like, what, what do you claim to know? Where have you practiced it? Where have you learned it for an entry level dev? If you're uh, like an intermediate or a senior level dev, I wanna see what do you know, where have you used those skills? And so it would be like your skills block and then your work experience and then anything else you wanna tell me. Um, that's just my preference when I'm looking at entry level uh, resumes. Um, and so I would move a lot of these over to that other side. Now, you've got your app over here. Um, I like that they've actually got uh, real uh, live links to their application as well as links to GitHub on here. Um, the reason I like this is because if all I see is a GitHub repo, it's like, okay, cool, you can write code and you can put it on GitHub. So can my 12 year old. Um, but by putting a live link on here, I can see that you can write working code. You can not only write code, but you can make a working application and you know about deployment and you can actually get it live for me to experience what you've built. For me, this is way more powerful than just a GitHub repo. I'm also hoping that your GitHub repo has a readme file that links over to that application and that maybe your application has a footer that says, hey, this project is open source, here's the GitHub repo. So have everything linked to one another on these things. I think that that would be super important as well. Uh, gonna go take a look at uh, some stuff in chat. Dota's been uh, sending lots of text. I appreciate that, Dota. Um, do you think he's coding in those roles? Uh, I'm not sure if that was the previous resume or this one. The reason I ask is none of those job description items are technical, it's just more personal stuff. Um, there's tech stuff in the projects. Yeah, I'd reorganize that. It took, <laughs> it took easily five minutes for me to realize that. Yeah, exactly. If it takes me a while to like scan over a resume going, what does this person know? Like, are they a good fit for this job? It's hard to find that on this resume for me. Um, and Dota, it took him several minutes to try to like piece together like, oh, you say you're a software engineer, but it's actually like none of the stuff over here tells me that you're a software engineer. Like most of this side of the page has nothing to do with software development at all. Um, and so it would be it would be important to reduce that. Keep this quantifiable stuff like you managed 500,000 worth of facility upgrades Like keep that kind of stuff on there. Um, but I would I would reduce uh, that other text on here. Um, I would also trim out Git, REST APIs, and GitHub under tech skills. Um, I would trim out GitHub. I think GitHub is not really a skill. GitHub is just a wrapper for Git. Um, Git is still like, yeah, it's like the most important software kind of uh, repository, you know, used today. I think it's still important to show that you know Git, though. Um, having a link to GitHub does kind of say like, yes, obviously I can use Git because I use GitHub. But I think um, because of what we teach at Turing, I know that there's more to, to that than just, you know, I know GitHub. Like they actually know how to do branching and a lot of command line stuff with Git uh, based on the curriculum at Turing. So having Git on there, I think is okay. Having RESTful API development on there, I think is important because we do teach REST development at Turing as well as RESTful API consumption. Um, and so they're both building APIs and consuming APIs. So calling out that you do RESTful APIs, I think in this case is appropriate uh, for that resume. Um, you link to GitHub. Yeah, so I mean, just linking GitHub. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like, okay, well, I know enough about Git to do like a Git add and a Git commit, but that doesn't mean that I can do branching and merge conflicts and all that kind of stuff that we actually teach at Turing. Um, and so by putting Git on there, I'm more likely to ask deeper questions about Git, about like, how have you done branching? How have you done this or that? Can you, you know, can you do, you know, merge conflict resolution on the command line or do you use GitHub for those? Like, um, you know, I can, I can ask more questions to better ascertain your skills by seeing the word Git on the resume. Um, now, if you list GitHub as a skill and I search for, I need somebody that knows about Git, it's still gonna pick up Git as part of GitHub but again, if I, were, if I were writing code for an applicant tracking system, 
if I was searching for a word and that word was part of a compound word, I would give it less of a score. So if I'm searching for Git and I see GitHub, I would treat that differently than if I actually saw the word Git on the page by itself, where it was actually the whole word by itself. Um, but that's if I was coding an ATS. I've never actually coded one. But um, And so I don't know whether an applicant tracking system would actually give different weight because it found it as part of a compound word or whether it found it as a standalone word. Um, same kind of thing with the indentation. So I like some of the indentation you've done over here for the projects, but again, because this column is, is pretty narrow compared to the right side of the page, um, having, having like multiple levels of indentation in here is just taking up space. Um, and so I don't think that it's as necessary. I would rather see these projects put out here on the right side where you're really calling out like, this is why I call myself a software engineer, a software developer. Like, you know, I did this, I built this thing. I, you know, this was a group project or this was a solo project. Like I like to see that kind of stuff called out as well. Um, where it's a little bit harder to see because you've condensed these projects so much. It's harder for me to tell how you've actually practiced uh, some of these skills. So that would be, uh, that'd be some of my takeaway on this one uh, for Brian. Um, who up here in the very top up here uh, in the tab uh, left their name as part of that. Otherwise, they did a pretty good job anonymizing this except for the, uh, the actual links for their app and their repo actually go over to their real uh, uh, GitHub. Well, actually the repo, actually this repo one is no longer a link. These other ones are. This repo one is not a link, but these other ones do and they actually go over to, uh, looks like they actually go over to a real GitHub account. So uh, let's see what else Dota says in chat. If he's going to, uh, if he's going for manager, he should say number of staff he managed in the management roles. Yeah, again, but it does depend on the kind of role. So if 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 I had a management type of role open, I would like a like a technical management role. This would actually be a pretty good resume for a technical manager because you've got technical skill, you've built out projects, and you're showing me management experience plus your military experience. Um, and so yeah, I agree with Dota on that. I would want to call out more about the management experience. But that's if this was for a management role. If I was using this resume for a software development role, I would overhaul this resume quite a bit um, just so that it screams, I am a software developer. Right now, there's a lot of stuff on here that says I'm not a software developer. Um, and then again, when it comes to the dates, I would put months on here as well because um, it's hard for me to tell, like, was this like a one-month program? Was it an all-year program? Like, when during 2021 did you attend Turing? For something like Colorado State University, you can just put your graduation year on there and just say graduated 2017. You don't have to tell me when you started. Um, and fewer companies care about GPA. Saying that you graduated magna cum laude is, is fine. Um, if you have other distinctions or things like that, you can definitely add those on there too. Um, in the States, he can call himself an engineer. Dota's asking, um, I mean, the whole thing about calling yourself an engineer versus developer, I mean, that's a bit of a nebulous thing. Uh, some people are pretty hung up on the title and say, well, you have to have gone to an engineering school if you're going to call yourself an engineer. Um, otherwise, you're just a developer. Um, I took a program where I was a computer engineering technologist. Do I call myself a software engineer? Yes. Uh, for me, um, I kind of look at it like I can build the entire system versus I can like put pieces together and build an application. Uh, versus I can actually go in and like architect the whole thing. Again, that's just my own opinion. Everyone's going to have different opinions on, uh, you know, whether they should call themselves an engineer or developer. And I'm not going to get into that on the stream. Um, I think a lot of people can have opinions on that and some of them get pretty toxic. And so I'm not going to entertain uh, uh, too much chat about that. Um, not technically allowed in Canada. Yeah, Canada is is pretty hung up on that because I went to school in Canada. Um, and yeah, going through an actual like engineering program, you get the little iron ring and the whole bit. Um, and But in the United States, you can also become a licensed engineer. Like you can get into IEEE and, and all that kind of stuff too. And you can actually get like, you know, engineering distinctions and, and things like that too. So um, it does depend on the role and it depends on, on your experience and things like that too. If a company calls you an engineer when you don't have an engineering background, are you an engineer? I mean, the company says you are. So, I mean, it, it really depends. It does depend a lot on location and logistics and things like that. Again, I try not to get too hung up on that, um, you know, as far as like what somebody should call themselves. I think you can, you can kind of give yourself any title you want as long as you're not grossly misrepresenting yourself. In, in Canada, though, with the regulations and, and things like that, the engineering process up there is quite strict. 
um, because of the importance of what it means to be an actual engineer. So yeah, there is a big difference in, in that. Um, at the same time, you know, I, I went to a community college in Canada. I was a computer engineering technologist and several of my jobs in Canada called me an engineer. And so I left that on my resume as my job title because that was my actual title. Do I call myself an engineer? I do now because I've done so much architecture level work that I can actually engineer things from the ground up from scratch if I had to. I generally wouldn't, but I could. So do I call myself an engineer? Yes. Um, but again, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna dwell on that too much. Um, cool. Well, that was Brian's resume and, um, let's see what else. So that was the other resume. So yeah, I think that's pretty much it that we'll cover, um, as far as our chat tonight, if there are other things going on, uh, there's still a handful of people viewing the stream. So if you do have other questions, I'm happy to entertain those. Also a little curious Dota, since you're on Twitch at the moment as part of the live stream, um, do you see the panels that I have on Twitch? Um, there's like the little about screen. And then I tried to make an interview prep topic panel where people could like submit topic ideas, but I don't know whether it works. I can see it, but I don't know whether other people can see it because nobody's ever submitted anything. So I don't know whether to draw attention to it or if it's just not showing up for other people. So I'm curious, uh, I'm curious if you can just check that out for me, Dota, since you're there and you're kind of active in chat. Could you go check out the uh, the panels on Twitch and tell me whether that interview prep it, it is showing up there? Can you try just adding something to the list, like just whatever it may be, just add add any old thing on there? Cool. Um, and Dota says is also tempted to send you a resume. Yeah. So if you're ever in the live chat, you can do a bang, uh, so exclamation point resume. Um, and it'll give you instructions on what to do, where to go. Uh, you can go to techinterview.guide slash streaming. And on that page, it talks about like the streaming and things like that. And at the bottom of that page, there's a form where you can upload a resume. Uh, seems to work. Okay, well, let me reload that page over here and let's see whether that actually shows up for me. Okay, apparently I have to give myself permission to myself in order to see the suggestion box. <laughs> it's weird. Um, salary negotiations, yeah, okay, cool. So that does come through. All right, so maybe I'll start drawing more attention to that. Like if you've got topics you want me to cover, like go check that out on Twitch. Um, or just drop in chat, like if you ever want me to cover a topic, I'll start making notes of those and start ranking them and, and things like that. Um, yeah, 